Good morning. I hope you're having a great day today. Before becoming an actor, young Burt Lancaster was a circus performer, and it was a job that he was lucky to land, despite his less than flawless audition. He was asked to perform on the parallel bars, so he leaped on the bars and he began his routine. And because he was a little nervous, his timing was off and he spun over the bar, falling flat on his face some 10 feet below. Bert was so humiliated that he immediately leaped back on the bar. As he spun again at the same point, he flipped off and he smashed to the ground once more. Well, Bert's tights were torn, he was cut and he was bleeding, and he was fiercely upset, so he leaped back again, but the third time was even worse. This time he fell on his back, and the agent came over, picked him up, and said, Son, if you don't do that again, you've got the job. <laughs> Bert Lancaster got a second chance, didn't he? <laughs> Now, how many times has a single event or an unfortunate failure in a person's life defined that life from that point on? Or maybe it has scarred his or her life from that point on. Why is it so common that we are hesitant to give a second chance or to let the victories of a person's life define them rather than their defeats? C.S. Lewis in the Screwtape Letters he vividly describes Satan's strategy. You see, Satan gets Christians to become preoccupied with their failures, and then on, the battle is won. Now, fortunately for Jonah and many others in Scripture, and very fortunately for you and I, our God is a God of the second chance. And you see, what God did for Jonah in giving him a second chance at success, he stands ready to do the same for you and I. Now, sometimes... When we talk with Christians, we get the impression that they believe that if you ever make a mistake, that it's over, that God could never, ever use you again. Now, if anyone should have thought that God was through with him, it ought to have been the man Jonah. And yet we read in Jonah chapter 3, verse 1, it says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. Now, not only was Jonah restored to fellowship with God, but he went on to preach perhaps the greatest revival that the world has ever known. Now God specializes in reaching out to us in the midst of our failure. And he knows that we are vulnerable and he knows that we're weak and dust and frail. And he never condones our disobedience and our rebellion throughout the Bible. We see that God always gives his saints a second chance. Now Moses, Moses, let's take a look at his life. Moses, his, his world was destroyed when he was 40 years of age because he murdered an Egyptian official. His only hope was to run to the backside of the desert where he spent the next 40 years of his life wondering if his life was finished. Now, God didn't leave him on the shelf or put him in the wastebasket. God restored Moses to service, and Moses became the great leader, the liberator, and the lawgiver of thousands of Hebrew slaves. Did God give Moses a second chance after he committed murder? He sure did. And it's likely that you and I have never committed murder, at least in act. But if God gave Moses a second chance, I think he'll do the same for you and I as well, don't you? So Moses, Moses got a second chance. How about David? David got a second chance as well. You know, the Bible says this about David, that he was a man after God's own heart. David was one of the greatest men in the Bible, but he committed open, flagrant, and grievous sins. On a night when he should have been in battle with his army, his people, he committed adultery with the wife of one of the most honorable soldiers that he had. And when he could not cover up the woman's pregnancy and his sin, he arranged her husband's death. So adultery, deceit, and murder... And in spite of it all, God gave David a second chance. You read in Psalm 32 and Psalm 51, and there, as you read that, it reveals the process of repentance and cleansing that David went through before he went on to become Israel's most godly king. Now, after being given a second chance by God, David filled page after page with the hymns of praise and thanksgiving, which we read in the Psalms. 
a young man asked the older man in the room, and he said, uh, he said, what's the secret of your success? And the, uh, the older man said, well, making good decisions. Well, how do you learn to make good decisions, the younger man asked. Well, you get that by experience, the older man said. Well, how do you get experience? The older man answered, by making bad decisions. <laughs> now, David would have never gotten the experience that he did to become the man of God that he became unless he made some lousy decisions. Now, we all make bad decisions from time to time, and we all need a second chance. So David and Moses needed second chances. The prodigal son, how about him? You know, all of us perhaps see ourselves in the prodigal son at one time or another in our lives. You know the story. One day a son came to his father and said, I want everything that is coming to me and I want it now. I'm tired of living here at home and I'm leaving. So he collected his inheritance. He took off for a far off distant country. Some suggested it might have been Las Vegas. <laughs> now, if his father had been some, like some fathers today, he might have said, well, good riddance, son. I paid him off, paid him to get him out of my life. He's gone. He's out of my hair. Thank goodness I don't have to deal with him ever again. But if you read the story here of the prodigal son, you get the impression in Luke 15 that the father anguished over this and might often have looked down the road to see if his son was coming home. Now, it is likely that the prodigal son thought that at best, he might be given a place to live if he returned home, but certainly not be given a second chance at sonship. But when he returned home, he was welcomed like royalty and restored with a robe and a ring. Question, did the prodigal son get a second chance? Yes, he did. The prodigal son got a second chance. Moses got a second chance. David got a second chance, and Peter today. Peter, while Simon Peter was supposed to be praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, what was he doing? He was sleeping. When he was supposed to be following the arrested Lord, he was running away. When he should have been comforting the disciples, he was warming himself by the fire of his enemies. And when he should have been defending the Lord, he denied three times that he even knew him. And then in John 21, a neat passage of scripture there, there, there's a wonderful recommissioning ceremony there. And then the Lord Jesus came alongside this disciple who had so miserably failed and loved him. And for every one of his denials, Christ recommissioned him. Three times in John 21, Jesus said, Simon Peter, do you love me? Simon Peter, do you love me? Simon Peter, do you love me? And after each time, Jesus said, feed my sheep. Take care of my lambs. Feed my sheep. Now, Simon Peter was restored to ministry and to service. And guess who preached the greatest sermon in the New Testament? It was Simon Peter on the day of Pentecost. There was a huge revival that broke out. You can read about it in Acts chapter 2. 3,000 people were added to their number that day. You see, God loved Peter back into fellowship and restored him to a place of ministry. And then there's also John Mark. John Mark. When the Apostle Paul went on his first missionary journey with Barnabas, he took along a young man named John Mark. And about halfway through this journey, John Mark decided that being a missionary wasn't all that great. He just wasn't cut out for it. So he left Paul and he left Barnabas and returned to Jerusalem. And later when Paul and Barnabas were going to visit the churches they established on their first trip, Barnabas wanted to take John Mark again, and Paul refused. You can read about this, uh, this uh, division in Acts chapter 13, verse 13, and Acts chapter 15, verses 37 through 39. So Paul and Barnabas, they split, they parted ways. Paul taking Silas and Barnabas taking John Mark. Now, it might appear that Paul never got over John Mark's failure, but if you fast forward it to the end of Paul's life and to the end of his ministry in a cold, dark, damp prison in Rome, you discover that, that Paul did not give up on John Mark. In fact, Paul gave him a second chance. Actually, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 11, 
it reads, Paul asks Timothy to get Mark and to bring him with him. And Paul says, for he is useful to me for ministry. So John Mark had gone from a defector to a disciple because he had been given a second chance. So God gave a murderer, an adulterer, a rebellious son, a coward, and a quitter, not to mention a hard-hearted prophet. He gave them all a second chance. And these chances don't come overnight, nor do they always happen the same way. Let's look at some of the ways that God has gotten the attention of his saints in order to give them a second chance. So these are second chance strategies. Number one is separation. Separation. You see, the doorway to Moses' second chance was separation. The Bible says this, that after Moses failed, he is sent to a Midian desert. For 40 years, he was separated from everyone except Jethro's family. Now, what was God doing as Moses was there in the desert? He was growing Moses. He was making Moses mature so that he would be ready for his second chance when the time was right. Now, what do you think Moses thought about for 40 years? I think he probably thought about the same thing that you and I would think about. And that is this, that if we hadn't been used by God for four decades, then God's through with us. I I'm finished for him. Aren't you glad that our thoughts are not God's thoughts? And then secondly, we see confrontation sometimes is the doorway to the second chance. While it took separation from Moses, for David it took confrontation. Now, since David wasn't owning up to his failures, he needed this confrontation. You see, what happened was this, that God sent the prophet Nathan, and Nathan tells David a parable. And this parable is about a humble Israelite who had been wronged, severely wronged. And David, the king, was furious that anything like that should happen, so he exploded. David said, whoever has done that should be killed. He deserves to die. And then Nathan shook his bony finger in David's face and said, David, you are the man. You are the culprit, 2 Samuel 12, 7. David had been found out, but through Nathan's confrontation, David's healing and David's restoring began. David became a king with a second chance. And then thirdly is desperation. Desperation sometimes becomes the doorway to a second chance. God dealt with the prodigal son through desperation. He had wasted his entire inheritance and was eating out of the pig's trough. His desperate situation caused him to come to his senses in Luke 15, verse 7. And God took him so low and put him so far down and took so much away from him that all he had left was desperation. And desperation became the prodigal son's doorway to a second chance. Fourthly, demonstration. Demonstration sometimes becomes the avenue for a second chance. For Peter, the Lord put on a demonstration. In Matthew 26, when Peter was making boastful statements about how much he loved the Lord, Jesus told him, I tell you the truth, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me, you will deny me three times. When we first went to Israel in 1998, um, I happened to be in Caiaphas' uh, uh, courtyard um, where Jesus was uh, put forth in, in a trial there and where Peter denied Christ. And when Peter heard the rooster crowing, while I was there in that courtyard, and you could see the steps and the, of the courtyard of that first century where Jesus and Peter were actually standing. And while I was there, I heard a rooster crow. Just a reminder of what took place that first century. But Jesus says, I tell you the truth, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me. You will deny me three times. And Peter perhaps thought, well, that's impossible. No way will I deny Christ. Well, later in the midst of his denials, it was the crowing of the rooster that brought Peter to his senses. And that drama broke Peter and he went out and he wept bitterly, the Bible says. And ultimately, this drama or this demonstration led to his second chance. And then affirmation. Affirmation sometimes becomes the avenue or the doorway for a second chance. What did God do for John Mark? 
he brought Barnabas alongside to affirm him. Now, John Mark didn't need separation or confrontation, but he needed affirmation. Barnabas's second chance strategy is affirmation. Now, John Mark needed a loving, encouraging person to come up, put his arms around him and say, I believe in you, and you can come back from what you did to go on to become great for God. So God used affirmation to get John Mark through the doorway to the second chance. And then number six, the last one, is isolation. Isolation. Sometimes the doorway, the pathway to a second chance is isolation. Now we already know that God's strategy for Jonah is isolation. He put Jonah in the belly of a huge fish where he had nothing to do but to pray and no one to talk to but to God. And more than likely, the company of 600,000 Ninevites started looking pretty good after five minutes of being in the whale's belly. In isolation, God gave Jonah a second chance. Now, regardless of the strategies that God Taylor makes for you and I, regardless of the size and shape of the doorway to the second chance, all of us go through stages of getting there. Now, what are some of those second chance stages? First of all, recognition. Recognition. Amazingly, people who are, to, who are out of fellowship with God can live in a world of denial about their sin or their failure. And before there can ever be a second chance, there must be a moment of recognition. A moment when a person says, the picture of my life that I am presenting to the world is a false picture. There is something wrong here and I will acknowledge or recognize my sin or failure and I'll quit making excuses for or justifying them. So there must be a moment of recognition. Now another second chance stage is this. It is remorse, remorse. Usually when a person has sinned against God and walked away from God's plan for their lives, they finally recognize what they've done, and there is remorse. Now, if remorse does not come, if there's no godly sorrow, there will never be gratitude for a second chance. The third stage is repentance, repentance. Remorse is often followed by repentance. Now, re repentance is this. Repentance is a change of mind. It's a change of heart or change of attitude. Repentance is a Middle Eastern word that describes the act of turning around when one realizes that he has been going in the wrong direction. And repentance says, I will turn around and walk another direction. Jonah was walking west and he turned around and began walking towards east, towards Nineveh, towards the will of God. So to repent is to say, I'm sorry that this happened and I realize that this is wrong and I will accept that what God has said about it is true, and right now I turn from my sin to God to walk in a new and righteous way. Repentance is a prerequisite for a second chance. And then number four is reflection. Reflection. It takes a while for the soul to heal, for the souls of those who have been hurt to heal, for trust to be reestablished, and this requires a time of reflection. And then number five, Reassignment, reassignment. In Jonah chapter three, verses one and two, then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message that I give you. What did God do? He recommissioned Jonah. He had a reassignment for him. In John 21, when Christ was standing in front of Peter and he said, Peter, do you love me? Peter said, yes. What did Jesus say? Feed my sheep. So Jesus reassigned Peter. Now, when we recognize what we have done, when we are remorseful over it, when we have repented, and have it, when we've had time to reflect on the whole process, then God is ready to reassign us. You see, it's never too late, and it's never too early to get on board with building God's lasting eternal kingdom. Aren't you glad that God is a God of a second chance? You see, time and time again, he calls us and he welcomes us to come on board with him to share his grace 
and to accomplish his purposes for this fleeting, vanishing, broken world. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. Aren't you glad that God gives us a second chance? Last night, I have to tell you, with close with this story, I was celebrating <laughs> a second chance. I had gone over to Illinois yesterday to celebrate with my siblings and their families. Uh, went to my brother's house over there and, and Arthur, and we were celebrating my mom's 90th birthday. And we were having a great time, and it's hard to leave when your family's there and, and you're celebrating a, an event like that. And it was late when I left, uh, I think probably around 10 o'clock our time over here in Indiana. And so I was in a hurry to get home. I, I, I was tired, uh, had got little sleep the night before, and, and I wanted to be careful going home. And, and well, anyhow, I, I was following a, a truck going right at speed limit on, um, on Route 133 there, heading towards Paris. And I was in a hurry to get home. It was night. And I was talking to Kathy on the cell phone. Now, I know I shouldn't have been doing that, but it was a lone stretch of highway, and it was dark, and I was talking to her, and I saw that truck, and I pulled around the truck, and I was going a little faster than I should have been going, and when I looked at the side of the truck, I saw that it belonged to the sheriff's department, and uh, I saw there was... Uh, there was uh, <laughs> lights above and everything I passed I passed that truck and, and immediately I, I slowed down <laughs> and <laughs> don't tell me by this but I hid the phone <laughs> I didn't want him seeing the light of the phone on as I was driving as well <laughs> and I thought I had been caught and I began I began thinking oh what am I going to say well, I was at my mom's 90th birthday party and I'm a pastor and I'm going back to Indiana and I got a service to do tomorrow and uh, it's late and I wanted to get home and just thinking of some excuses. Well, <laughs> lo and behold, those lights did not go on and he turned off in the road uh, and, and was not following me any longer. He followed me for several miles and was not following me any longer and so I took a deep breath and I said, thank you, Lord. And I slowed down from that point on. <laughs> but I, I had received a second chance. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that God gives us a second chance? He's ready and he's willing and he's waiting for us to return to him. Let's close in prayer. Father, I thank you for the reminder that you've given to us today. Thank you that you are the God who gives us chance after chance after chance. And you're a God that longs for our fellowship and our friendship. You desire a personal relationship with us, and through the cross you made that possible. In John three sixteen, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And we're so thankful that you initiated this process of us having a relationship with you. And sometimes we humans get kind of earthly minded and we kind of turn in a wrong direction. And I pray, Father, that you would remind us that we need to turn towards you. And that when we are turning towards you, those will be the most happiest moments of our lives. And our lives will be filled with peace when that happens as well. Remind us as we see Jonah. Jonah turned and went in the opposite direction that you had called him to go. And when he did that, there was turmoil. I mean, there was trouble. But when he turned towards you, um, peace came to his life. And so remind us of that as well, that uh, as we stay turned towards you and following you and your will, our lives will be a whole lot more pleasant. Just thank you for this reminder today, Father. And again, thank you for making it possible for us to have a friendship with you. The greatest treasure one could ever have is having a relationship with you. And you made that possible through the cross. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.